This is really inspiring. I think this is incredible. This space just shows that there is a lot of education out there. We got to decide who we wanted to be and what we wanted to say. Of what the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge does. To show the possibilities of what we can bring to the industry. We are at Sony Picture Studio! Ten years of filmmaking here. Congratulations to all of you talented actors in this space. So proud of this whole event. This is groundbreaking stuff that's happening here. For the first time, there's true progress. Happy 10th anniversary. Happy 10th anniversary. Happy 10th anniversary. Happy 10th anniversary. Anniversary. Happy 10th anniversary! Hello! Welcome everybody! I am Nick Novicki. I'm the founder and director of the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. I am a little person uh, with a little bit of scruff on my face. I am wearing a red suit jacket because I'm also auditioning to be the newest temptation. Uh, no, I am just so excited and honored because today we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. And we have a panel on authentic casting in partnership with the CSA who have been so supportive the entire time that we have been doing the Easter Sales Disability Film Challenge. And then right after this panel, we are going to have a time where we can all just get together, a reception, and then at 2.30 today, downstairs in the Chinese Theater, we are screening the winners of the 2023 Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. You'll we'll see those winners on that poster right over here. How cool is this? You know that we are literally right below where the Academy Awards are. Right below where the Academy Awards are. I mean, this is pretty cool. I, I'm so excited, you know, because, you know, we got all the people out there, the superheroes. You know, and I'm in a weird stage in my career, you know, because I get recognized a lot, but like people have no idea what they know me from. So it goes from being really exciting to really awkward because people are like, I know you. And then I get excited and then they're like, what do I know you from? And then it gets awkward because I got to like sing and dance everything I've ever done. Like, hey, hey, you recognize me? You started this transaction. I had one lady, she was relentless. Like, she was following me down the street. She's like, what have you been in? You know, she's like, I know you from something. So I'm naming things. She's like, I don't know you from that. I don't know you from that. I definitely don't know you from that. <laughs> she's like, wait a minute. You weren't bad Santa, were you? I was like, he was black. <laughs> How about you don't know who I am? But now, I'll be honest, you know, right here, you do get recognized. I got recognized. Somebody did recognize me for what I was in, and, you know, they were very excited. They were like, can I get a photo with you? I was like, absolutely, let's take a photo. And we start to take a photo. He's like, do you mind if we do one where I'm on, you know, you're on my shoulders? I was like, uh, no. <laughs> He's like, why? I was like, well, a couple things. Uh, first of all, I'm 40, so that's the biggest thing. So uh, second of all, you know, I'm sag after and there's a strike, so I can't do stunt work. <laughs> now, I know we're in a time where, you know, this, this is an unprecedented time. But today, this is all about learning. This is all about networking. This is all about being together. Because what we can all agree on is that there is so much talent in the disability community. And I feel so honored that over the last 10 years, we have 600 films that have been created from around the world. And this is people with disabilities taking their career in their own hands. And I am about to bring up some of the biggest casting directors in the world who have been so kind to come here and, and be here in support of the film challenge of the disability community. So we're going to hear from them and we are going to have a time where you're going to be able to ask questions. And, you know, we have the uh, Nancy Weintraub, the chief advancement officer, Easter Seals, Southern California. After the panel, she's going to roll around with the microphone. So if you have questions, we want you to introduce yourself, raise your hand. Uh, raise your hook, whatever you got, uh, you know, ultimately 
this is about being together because right after we're done with this, we're gonna have some champagne, uh, mimosas, have a bagel, have coffee, but we're all in this together. So are you guys ready for an amazing day? All right, now, before I bring up our unbelievable moderator and our panelists, I just wanna say again, one more time, how honored I am that the Film Challenge has been a resource for so many casting directors and producers. So over the last 10 years, it's led to so many jobs and I just truly feel honored. So before we bring up our moderator and our panelists, I wanna show a, clip, uh, a quick clip of some of those recent success stories and then I'm gonna bring them up, all right? So thank you so much. Round of applause for yourselves, thank you. I launched the Disability Film Challenge over the course of a weekend. Participants write, shoot, edit, and submit three to five minute films that have somebody with a disability in front of or behind the camera. Partnering with Easter Seals Southern California really took it to the next level. To date, we've had countless success stories, and ultimately, we're changing the way people see disability in Hollywood. I am very grateful for the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge for giving people like me a chance to star in their own films and be recognized in them. I wrote, produced, and created my own film and it led to this amazing opportunity. It's a game changer for your career. I've made huge connections at HBO. I've gotten to have interviews with Academy Award winning editors. I've been a Disability Film Challenge judge for nine years and I'm always looking for ways to represent the disabled community. So when it came time to cast the kids in Marry Me, I opened it to all ethnicities cities, all genders, and all abilities. And in that amazing process, I found Leah, who absolutely rocked it, dancing next to J-Lo. It was actually unexpected. It was through the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. I'm asked to present an award at the Disability Film Challenge. I saw a short film starring Nicole Evans, and I knew that I wanted her to be in season two of Special, and she is. She's incredible. A producer from a, a Disney Plus show saw the Disability Film Challenge documentary and they reached out to me to direct an episode for Brie Larson's Growing Up. I was invited to participate in the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge voiceover workshop at DreamWorks in January of 2020. A year later, I booked a series regular voiceover role in the soon to be released Hutstruction. In 2018, I did my first Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge, which ended up winning Best Film, which ended up getting me my agent, which ended up letting me do my first guest star on NBC New Amsterdam. The industry is waking up to the value of authentically portraying characters with disabilities and including more people with disabilities in roles, and specifically in roles that don't have to do with their disabilities. Now, before we start this panel, one, I gotta give a huge shout out to Evangeline. She's a harp player right there. She was playing the harp before. You know, she's a film challenge participant. She's like, I play the harp too. I was like, hey, uh, we gotta talk. Uh, you gotta <laughs> come on down. So one more time, thank you so much to Holly Shorts. You guys have been there from the beginning, screening our films, the CSA. And now let's bring up our moderator, uh, he is a senior producer from CNN, has been so supportive of the film challenge. You may have heard his voice in the video. Uh, he spotlighted us in the challenge uh, through the Hollywood Minute, and he is going to bring up the rest of our incredible panel. So without further ado, our moderator, David Daniel, and the panel. Uh, I'm David Daniel, a longtime uh, broadcast journalist in entertainment for CNN. I am wearing glasses, a purple shirt, and black slacks, and increasingly graying hair. And it is my goal that you hear a lot less from me today than you do from our marvelous panelists, because they are the ones doing the work that we all benefit from and that you want to know about. Uh, who else uh, besides me was here last year? A lot of familiar faces. It's been a year, hasn't it? Yeah. A, lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of things happening. Uh, 
some people not working as much as they would like to, some people having to work more in different directions than they like to. And it strikes me that uh, there's an old supposed curse, may you live in interesting times. <laughs> and I think we all understand why that's a curse and not, not anything else. The most, uh, the book that everybody that I talk to in Hollywood is reading right now is Maureen Ryan's Burn It Down which addresses some other issues in, in Hollywood. But it also reminds me that a turbulent time like this is when change happens. Revolutions, turbulence, and change is what we're talking about. The rate of change, the level of change, the growing awareness of disability as part of the diversity conversation in Hollywood. And that's something that everyone comes to in a different way and at a different time. For me, it was six years ago when I first met Hurricane Nick Novicki uh, at a Variety Inclusion Summit, and my world was changed forever. I'd like to open up the discussion by asking our wonderful panelists to introduce themselves and to give us an idea where you entered that part of the conversation, if it was a singular memorable moment, like meeting Nick is, or if it was a process, if it was gradual. Um, so we'll start here with Mark and just go on. Uh, hi, is this on? Not. I'm not on. How's that? Oh my god. <laughs> That's on. Um, hi, I'm Mark Bennett. I'm wearing uh, hair that is also increasingly graying, uh, black and off black. Um, because it's summer. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's interesting, you know, for me, having come up from a very um, independent film framework, one of the things that always most excited me was the idea of uh, giving opportunities to, to people who are deserving and who maybe hadn't had that opportunity. That's a large part of what working on that end of the spectrum can do. Um, and also casting in such a way that creates a real sense of the world in which we all live. Um, also, my best friend in college uh, was in a wheelchair, which was a very illuminating experience for me up until that point. Real watching him navigate, this was the 90s, but watching him navigate Manhattan in the 90s um, really brought to my naive attention, you know, um, how many obstacles the world unfairly puts in front of certain people. Um, so I've always felt that it was a, doing this work was a great opportunity to create showcases for deserving people and to contribute to films that really show the world in the way in which it really is. So I don't know if that's the kind of answer you were looking for, but. I think it's great. <laughs> great. Mary? Hi, I'm Mary Hidalgo. I have a black dress, black glasses, a beautiful Bucky Beaver bag right here. <laughs> um, I predominantly work in animation, which is voiceover. And, you know, it's, it's for a long time, it's been a male-dominated venue. You know, directors, writers, storyboard artists. And when I started, it was, you know, I felt it was part of my job to help be more inclusive. You know, it started, you know, with women, because in those, those days, not even, roles were not even written for women. So once we kind of broke that barrier, then there were all other barriers that needed to be broken. And so they have to, you know, it starts with our writers, our writers and our creators that can make a difference to casting because you know if, if if those characters are included in the film then that gives opportunity and that gives focus and that makes more it encourages more people with disabilities and with other things that that that, that never thought that they could be actors so it's just you know that's where you know and it's it's very slow with you know animation you know but it's it's happening and i'm so very happy about that Wonderful. Um, hi, wow, yeah, this is crazy. 
In the Silsine, Newa Natoka Candido Cornejo. Hello, my name is Candido Cornejo. Um, I am a queer, Latin, -A, indigenous, trans person, um, otherwise known as a Muche from the southern tribes of Mexico. Um, I am, have long curly hair, uh, black from the top, and then a ribbon skirt uh, that's red and polka dotted as well. Um, so it, it's, yeah, I think that I've been really, really privileged to be working with wonderful people that always had the conversations. One of my mentors is Pam Dixon, who really started the conversations with people with disabilities and talked to Gary Marsh and Breakdown Services and expanded a, a lot of conversations in the very beginning. And then I actually went to work with Felicia Joseph and Patricia Ewan Kern at ABC and work the showcases with them and really opened up the conversations of diversities. And years fast forward, I'm now um, on the board of CSA. I'm a second year appointed um, and working under Felicia Joseph and Danielle pretzfelder Demchik, who also put this together. Thank you, Danielle, DBD. I know she's in New York with a baby. Um, but it's, it's, it's been a, it has been a gradual conversation, but it's been really wonderful because I think in this time we could now open the conversations and, and challenge if we have to and basically say that it's okay to ask questions. If you don't know, we would be more than happy to have um, some answers for you if possible um, or let's have the conversation together. Let's grow together. Everything that I am is because I've been allowed to have the conversations and be like, it's okay to be a trans queer indigenous person, you know? Um, and so it is a wonderful time, but it's all about um, having the conversations with the communities respectfully um, and appropriately as well. So thank you, on to April. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, first off, I really just want to acknowledge everyone who came today. Um, there, it, this is about community, and this is about being in the conversation. So the fact that everyone has made their time on a Sunday afternoon to be here is really terrific. Um, my name is April Webster, I'm, and as usual, wearing all black. Um, <laughs> I have long white hair, and I'm wearing um, orange uh, vintage earrings that are square. Um, I use the pronouns he, uh, she, and he, uh, she and her. Um, in terms of, I've been, working, I've been working in the industry for a really long time. Uh, when I was in New York, I worked in the theater. I came out to LA in 1978. I would say the, and I know I'm dating myself, but who cares. Um, I was a kid, I mean, I was very young. <laughs> I, was, I was 12. No. Um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> very, very uh, precocious. Anyway, um, I, I went to work at the Mark Taper Forum. I got a job there right, right away because I was someone who came from the theater. I, was, I wanted to work in the theater. I wasn't interested in, in that time moving to film, and so that was very attractive to them. And I had a very wide experience. I had been a prop builder and a, and a stage manager and a director and all those things. So they felt that there was something very valuable for me there. Unfortunately, the program I was in, which was the ITP company, um, dropped the funding for, uh, for that particular company. And um, I just kept hanging around the taper because they liked me, they kept giving me different jobs, and then I got a job at the casting office. And I think, I would say that the definitive change for me was working on Children of a Lesser God. Because part of that, even though I've always been an advocate, even when I was in New York, um, I think that learning sign language, learning how to communicate in a different way, um, having more of an open mind to like how people communicate, that was a big deal for me. And since it was already kind of in my bloodstream, uh, really pushed me in, in that direction and worked with the media access office quite a bit, won a couple of awards there. Um, for a lot of different work, and I, and I say that without hubris, I say that because that action helped create, I mean, cause the, because the um, CSA at that time was just really pretty much starting. And so we created what we called then the non-traditional casting department, casting committee. And um, obviously the name has changed a number of times since then. We don't call it non-traditional 
casting. This is traditional casting. Someone mentioned about making sure that the demographic was covered. I think, Mark, you had said that we see the world as it exists, and that's something that we were really committed to doing. Um, what's happening now is, there's, whether it's been by, by force or by open mind, more people are taking training um, are trying, uh, you know, are doing their best to listen more, are addressing their um, unconscious bias, um, and that includes myself, uh, of course, um, because until you until you really listen to someone, you really don't know what's going on in their lives, and that th that's anybody. But particularly when you're talking to performers who have other challenges. Um, for example, someone said to me today, because of certain challenges, that their employment was restricted and they lost their insurance. So um, it's, it's starting. I agree with Candida that there is a, a conversation that started um, and hopefully will continue and grow and not be a fad. I think that's going to be up to people in the community and the casting directors who really care about it, who can push the producers who really care about it, like Mr. Farrelly and others, to continue on. April, you talked about, uh, about being an advocate and about listening, and, and you and Candida both alluded to the fact that this is an ongoing conversation. Uh, uh, one of our panelists last year, uh, Jenny Ju, uh -huh. mentioned the difference between diversity, inclusion, and belonging, mm. and that inclusion without belonging is just tokenism. And that's obviously not the goal of anybody in this room. I'd like to get a sense, maybe we'll go the other direction this time. Where is Hollywood right now in 2023 in terms of that conversation, in terms of what you're trying to do versus the reality on the ground, the general sense of if this is something that matters to the creators, to the executives, how much, how much have we accomplished and, and, and how far do we yet have to go? Well, I would say that the studios are feeling compelled to make sure that they are covered. And as I said, whether it's, whether it's coerced or out of, you know, out of the true great sense, that at least they're staying on top of it and making sure that they're diverse. Um, I, the word inclusion to me means that someone's including you, which already feels like it's um, some sort of uh, welcome to the club. And, and so I, I, I don't personally like to use that word myself. Um, you know, it's going to be really up to the producers and how you can, because we, we're not the writers, we're, but we can suggest. There was a, and I think that a lot of times, and I've discussed this with a couple of people in the room already, that when we're talking about diversity and um, equity, that a lot of times the community of actors with disabilities um, doesn't get included in that conversation. And so that's something that is really important for us to, to keep bringing up. Um, I, I, I was casting Criminal Minds again. <laughs> I did the original series and then I, I, I fell away um, and let Scott David take it. Um, and we had a leader of a 12-step um, group. And so I said, this is a perfect opportunity. I said to the studio, this is a perfect opportunity to cast someone with a disability because it's just that you need a good actor who can have the humor and everything else. So we did, you know, we did do that. But it's like you have to stay on top of it yourself. You have to stay aware and conscious. And, you know, with the rush when you do episodic television, those of you who have worked in, in episodic television know that sometimes you have two days to cast. And it can be, and in those shows, especially if they shoot in Los Angeles, can be, you know, 24 characters. Um, so, but still, it's, you know, to keep it on top of your brain, to keep remembering that everyone is part of the community. And you want to show, you want to show the world as it exists. So that's kind of where it's going now is that people are feeling responsible. And so I think that's a great thing that at least, you know, they're talking about it and being open, more, more open to it. If you can, and you don't have to give 
names or, or, or specifics, but if you can give us ideas of things you've actually seen on projects that are either going in this direction or that you're, or you're seeing obstacles you didn't, didn't expect or didn't hope for. Uh, well, I mean, I can't say specific names because I want to get hired again, but like, <laughs> but, but I mean, like, look, I, I think that I was speaking with Irene Cabrera, who's a wonderful agent in Paradigm, uh, New York, and we launched um, uh, an, an initiative called Mi Gente for CSA, which is a large Latin A search around the world, and April very generously helped us, where we saw like 3,500 uh, 3, people all over the world um, and to be seen by cast and directors, and so at this level. But um, when I was talking to her about this event, you know, the one thing that she said, and it really stuck to me was, I love the idea behind this, and I love that a lot of places have the right ideas. I question the commitment. So how committed are you? And it needs to, it can't just be a conversation, it needs to be action. What is the action that we are doing afterwards and the commitment behind that action? And it really did, did stick to me. And so, um, and so I get hired to do a lot of specialty casting, and so there was an incident where I was hired by you know, a large studio and to cast a particular role and, and a particular group of people in a particular community. And it wasn't necessarily the studio, the studio was well behind it, but it was an organization that I'm not gonna say which one, um, but that basically got in the way and was like, why are you wanting to hire non-blank people um, when there's so many blank people working? And why can't you just hire somebody that looks like them and hire a choreographer and teach them how to do a specific thing? If you don't know, I'm pointing at what, what, who we are. Um, and so, and I really had to look at them and say like, listen, um, if you could show me a list of Native American or First Nations or Indigenous people that are that, I will more than happy see them. Quiet, right? So it's my job to take that extra step and remind them of why I was hired to do this because this particular community deserves to be represented. And this could be a, like an ongoing conversation about like, okay, are they ready? Are they not ready, et cetera? But I have to try. And so there are moments where yes, the studios and networks and producers, I agree with April, it, it, the producers need to be on our side. And yes, they are mostly on our side, but we need to remind them. And it's not just us casting people, it's actors, it's, it's the writers, it's, it's the community community of like, we're here for a reason, you asked us to show up, now let us show up and let us do the work. Sorry, Mary, go ahead. Sorry. No, I just, uh, I, do you want to go ahead? Uh, I, no, I just had one other thing to say is that it also can become habit. You know, you look at a show like New Amsterdam and the casting director on that has always been inclusive. In fact, there was, a, there was a little person who played a doctor on the show, and he, and he was in a number of episodes, he recurred on a number of episodes, and he called his mother and said, Mom, I never thought I would ever play a role like this. And, and, I, and I'm embarrassed that I can't remember the casting director's name, it's a Greek name and I can't remember what it is, but, but, I mean, but he has always been committed to that, and so he's gotten his producers into the flow of that. So he brings in, you know, he, he doesn't discriminate in terms of who he brings in. He just brings in good actors. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, what April said, I mean, like, the more, the more, uh, the more roles, the more people go, oh, yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. As long as they can deliver the goods, that's all we care about. I, I work with Lord and Miller. They're very inclusive most of the time. They love... You know, they love an opportunity, and they understand that it's a, you know, it starts slowly, but like once people, like I said earlier, like once people see that there's a person that represents them, it just encourages other people, because it's, you know, it's a small pool. You know, you want to get, you know, you just want to be, you know, have more and more and more actors, you know, in every form, every size, every shape, every color, everything. That's all we want, like good actors. And so, you know, working with really great producers, Lord Miller, Jared Hess I worked on a movie with, he was very inclusive. It just, you know, the, our creators, once it gets to them, you know, we're, we're on our way. So, yeah. 
That's great. Mark? Yeah. Um, I think that, the, as April pointed out, it's possible these companies are at times feeling compelled to make these changes, but they're making the changes. Um, and even on smaller projects, all these projects are for profit. So everybody wants, you know, and has a public aspect to it. So everyone wants to do the right thing and also perhaps at, at times to be seen to be doing the right thing. Um, and I think what often seems to move things forward is when a piece of casting happens and these companies see that, oh my God, everybody loved it and it made a lot of money. Tons of people watched it and everybody loved it. I mean, I think we've all been doing it long enough to remember a time where this is a very different experience, but where actors of color were not carrying the leads in corporate funded studio and network projects to the same degree that they are now. And I think that happened because, you know, for a long time there'd be a sense of, oh, well, maybe not for the lead, but maybe for the second lead. And, you know, as, as April said, the, un the unconscious biases that come through. Um, but then movies started actually making a lot of money. I think that has a lot to do with, I mean, the culture's changing and also younger people showing up who want to see these more eclectic, more diverse experiences represented. And so now everybody wants to make them. Um, so I think there's a lot of change moving forward. It's not all happening on the same timeline. But I think when a film like Coda, for example, cleans up, yeah. um, everybody wants to have their Coda, you know, of course. Um, and there are unconscious biases. I've had this sort of experience of, a group of very well-intended, liberal-minded creatives who might, I might suggest a piece of casting that is not what they'd initially conceived, because sometimes writers write things in a way that represents all the things that have come before, and they sometimes like to write characters that look very much like themselves and the people they know, and we're still in a space where a lot of those people are not from underrepresented communities. And I've definitely had the conversation of, oh, well, I'd love to cast that way, but, I don't know, in that part, is that the right way to do it? Is that, is that, what are we saying? Is that the right, you know, there's a lot of sort of, and people sort of think themselves out of this because there's a fear of, is this my story to tell? Will it be seen to be my story to tell? I've had that conversation where somebody doesn't want to do a broad sweeping change to their story through the casting because they'll feel like, oh, can I do justice to this? And will I be criticized if I get it wrong? Because there's a lot of fear motivated decisions in this business as in any, business where millions of dollars are being spent. I think for me the most successful version of addressing that has been like I recently had an experience, very recently, where one of the leads in a film I was doing we cast with a deaf actor and it was not written that way. Um, a well-known deaf actor who we cast because they were put forward and we all loved this actor and they were the best actor for the part. Um, it was not written that way. It was actually a very action-driven script so we sat and we kind of went through you know, because good writing is specific and it's thoughtful. And we went through and we said, okay, does this inform the writing in any way that undermines what you're trying to do? And if anything, it didn't thematically and it added something. And that was the best way to justify that change was to say, look, not only is this uh, adhering to ethics of representing all kinds of people, but your movie got better um, because it added another layer to an already good character, another layer of experience. And I think we're starting to see now that this is not, there is an idea that, oh, I, unless the story's really about that, I don't know. It's like, no, people actually want to see this when it's done thoughtfully and done well. So, yeah. It's, you've, you've mentioned, and I, I, got, I want to move it along to get some more before we get to the Q&A. Um, it is definitely one thing to have the intent to cast diversely and, and authentically. It's another to have avenues to do that, uh, to... You know, you, you mentioned the program to bring thousands of potential uh, choices as actors to people who weren't necessarily on anyone's radar. There's this Entertainment Disability Film Challenge I keep hearing about. There's the CSA itself. There, there's social media. There's uh, Ava DuVernay's company Array, which is working on that. What are you finding, uh, before we, we throw it to the, the Q&A, uh, that helps you accomplish this intent, and what is it that actors can do to help you find them? And anyone, forget order, we're, we're towards the end. Anybody who wants to jump in? <laughs> uh, I think in the tape, um, Nick mentioned creating your own content. Uh, 
And that becomes a really good way to showcase yourself, if you will. Because if you don't have an agent yet, um, if you're not in a play, or if you're not part of a theater company or something like that, having something that we can take a look at and see you on camera is so useful to us. And of course, ten attending things like this. I mean, so many of the people I know um, in, in this community come from doing workshops, but at that time we were meeting everybody in person. I have to say that that's the one thing that Zoom sort of has, I mean, that, that the pandemic sort of took away because when we meet people and you, and you sit with them, you get to know them, not just what performance they put on the tape. And I have to say, I kind of miss that. I mean, not, I can see a lot more actors now, but I do miss that personal connection. I mean, people like Eileen and you know, other people in the room that I've known for years um, because I've worked with them. Um, I mean, so I would say that was one of the ways that they that people could be in touch or to or to um, send a you know Facebook message or something. I just would be careful and be discerning how you how you um, introduce yourself to someone. And if you have a connection of any kind that you know someone else in the community that you know I know, for example, um, because we we work in this. Um, diversity committee. We have been exposed to, a, we've had workshops for actors across the board um, of, I, th I think we even did, we had neurodiversity, we had trans, we had, um, I mean, we, veterans, you know, and we just, we've been constantly making sure that we've seen everyone, um, you know, Native, Native Americans, that kind of thing. So if you did a, one of those workshops, and you know that the tape was seen, that's a good way to sort of notate, as opposed to sort of blanket marketing. Um, target marketing is the best thing that you can do. If, if I have a kind of movie or a kind of show that you feel would be open you know, to you from just looking at the other casting of the shows, then that's a good time to contact me or to have your agent contact me or whatever other contact that you have, so. Um, and to piggyback off of that, um, it's one of the good things about creating your own content is that you are ready. And I always tell actors, because we're always looking, we're always looking with agents and breakdowns and, and looking at our actors. Um, and then when we can't find it there, then we go to the communities. My office goes to the actual communities and sees who can walk and talk and who could do you know, this and that. Um, but it's, but I, I'm amazed where, where many actors are like, oh, I don't have my reel yet, or I don't wanna show you this, or I don't wanna show you that. It's like, why not? Like, this is literally the moment where I come to you and I say, can you show me your reel? Can, and this is when this, when this stuff matters. It's like, I'm a winner of the Easter Seals Film, uh, film Challenge. I, I took a class with so-and-so, you know, whatever that is, those things really, really absolutely matter because it's going to entice us to, to meet you and to, and to see you. And even though if you're not ready for, or not right for this particular thing, you better believe that we keep tabs on you and, and we, we keep you in mind for specific things. And I think now more than ever, I think that between us casting people, we really talk amongst each other now and say, hey, I found this person, you know, please meet this person. I, I talk to Angelique Mithender all the time and Carla Hool. I'm like, what do you have, what do you have? I'm looking for this, I'm looking for that. And then we recommend each other actors now. And so, uh, but these materials, these, these tokens, we, we live in a day and age where you could literally film something on your phone. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it on your phone, because if you do it, you should do great quality, always great quality, Preference Champion says. But, um, but yeah, but just be prepared and, and help each other out. Um, when we talk to the communities, I think that I find certain people that they get a little like, well, it's my opportunity. I don't wanna like, no, help each other out. Recommend like, hey, this casting person is looking for this. Here's the flyer, you know, because you could tell the communities that really help each other out and recommend, like that's important too. So that's my spiel. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've, I've contacted Tobias Forrest and asked him for people or, you know, looking for neurodiverse people where I've gone to make sure, you know, make sure of those things. So that's great. Mary, Mark, anything quickly before we 
throw it to, uh, to our Q&A? I'm with you two. Like, um, I, there's nothing better than a TikTok or a YouTube for me. Like, it just delivers so much information about the person and about your abilities and your voice and your talents. And also, the fact that you've made something, you've put it out there, that shows your, your drive to, to participate. So that's, that's what I want. One, one thing we've seen in this massive move towards self-taping over in-person auditions is how incredibly polished some of these self-submissions are at this point. It's really extraordinary. Um, and sometimes I've noticed when, reaching out, when I'm reaching out to groups where the performers might have been traditionally underrepresented, they may not have had the benefit of spending 15 years in the Hollywood actor industrial complex. You know, because acting well and auditioning well are overlapping sets, but those are actually not the same thing. And sometimes we get these tapes that look like screen tests, and I think some of the decision makers are getting used to seeing that. Yeah. I think primarily it's our responsibility to set the actor up to succeed and to tell the people seeing the tape, look, this actor doesn't have a home studio, this actor may not have auditioned 2,000 times yet, but there's talent there, try to separate the two things, but I think it is worth seeing what the community standards are. I hate to, I know it's a sensitive subject and I never ask an actor to go out and buy lights, any of that stuff, I completely get the concerns around that, but I also think it's useful to know what the baseline is for self-tapes. I'm not talking about stuff that looks like an old Hollywood screen test, I just mean just a basic, you know, professional, you look like you've spent time with the material, things like that, because otherwise some of these auditors may not be able to separate those two things. Yeah. What? I just wanted to say to that, to that story is that we all have stories to tell. Everyone has their own story to tell. That's why CODA did so well, I think, on that level. It was a fresh story. It was a story no one had seen before. So you make that story. Absolutely. <laughs> Mary mentioned drive. I don't think lack of drive is an issue for anybody in this room, your, your presence here, and you're about to, to make that point again. We're gonna throw it open to some questions. If I don't think anybody here would have any questions of this illustrious, no. I'm gonna uh, handle over here. John's gonna handle over there. So John, I think you've got a couple of folks first. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for coming. It was really informative and I appreciate all of you. Um, I, during the pandemic, um, my a partner, he's, he has autism, and then I'm obviously you know, disabled too, so we're both disabled, and um, I, just, I asked him if he would make tech talks with me, because he likes to have, he, he's um, really into like police and fire uniforms and, and stuff like that, and then when we started doing it, it's like, I'm really happy, I, it was for fun, but I'm like, wow, he's really good, <laughs> I think he's a great actor, and he's not even trying to be an actor, he has no interest in being an actor, but, um, I'm really happy with what we're producing. And I would like to, like, we're small, we only have like, we're almost at 15,000 followers. I know that's tiny, but how would I submit things if you want, if I want us to, you know, want it to be seen? Like I act in some of them, but off camera, I'm too shy to be on camera. Um, even though I love acting, I went to acting school back in the day and stuff and I love to do the acting, but um, yeah, I just don't know what next steps are if I, because I do want to get back into this, where, you know, with the disability going into the, entertainment. Um, so, like I said, like always be ready because you never know. Um, the big thing that I've learned is that social media is huge now. I can't tell you, post, we post all the time. Carla Hull's posting, Angelique Mithender's posting, Danielle Pretzfelder is posting. And so uh, follow them for sure because you're gonna, they're gonna post something that we can't find on Actors Access or Breakdown Services or per agent. And then have that package ready. Have the resume, have your reel, have the content. And also don't get discouraged. Like you may not have like this big fancy reel, that's fine. As long as you have content that we could see, totally acceptable. Um, but have that package ready. Get your, act, you know, your Actors Access profile you know, going. Um, and then just be absolutely ready and then follow these organizations because um, I ended up doing something for Easter Seals. I don't know if I should, I should talk about it, but, um, but uh, you know, um, I talked to Danielle and she sent me this huge list of organizations and Facebook groups and it was insane, Danielle. Like that's like it's phenomenal. Crazy. Yeah, but it's, it was like 500 Facebook groups. With a new baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. And then I post in every single group and that's how I started getting the submissions of the people that I was looking for. But this is when you could tell like it's, it's your picture, it's your 
reels, it's your content, it's your TikTok. Um, let me get to know you because you better believe that we're looking at every single submission. Um, and social media, I mean, I never, th I came from offices where we hated social media. Oh, I, I would never. And then literally a week later, I was like, oh crap. Like, <laughs> like I'm posting a flyer on my social media. But um, that's, that's one thing for sure. As many avenues as possible, absolutely. Yeah. Um, hi, thank you so much for this panel. Um, I was just wondering about, um, it's frowned upon for you know, non-disability people to play disabilities, I guess now. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about invisible illnesses when it comes to uh, disabilities. Um, and for example, like an anxiety disorder, um, how do you feel about then people without anxiety disorders playing that. And then that, you know, it's like a gray area when it comes over to emotion. Yeah. It's, it's a, I would imagine it's, it's, a, it's a tough call and it's often about the specific project. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, if, if I'm looking for someone who's neurodiverse, that's one thing, you know, I know that there's a community of actors <clears throat> with that particular that particular category, but um, I mean, a lot of people, I mean, yes, there are people who have panic attacks and anxiety disorders, including myself, you know, I mean, so it's hard to, it's really hard to sort of sort that away from everything else. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not um, saying that it's not a disability. Uh, I'm just not sure how to, where, you know, how that question would go. It's a good question though to begin taking a look at. Um, for me, like, I actually, had a conversation because we were working on a script like this and I was talking to my staff and we had this beautiful heart to heart with one of my assistants who is of neurodiversity and then he kind of came out and told me like he's got Asperger's actually. And, um, and so it was, it was a beautiful heart to heart that we had and then I thought that it was really important for me to have this conversation with my, with my community and my actors and, and find a really sensitive way because we can't ask I can't be like, are you neurodiverse? Are you neurodiverse? Are you, you know, I can't, I can't really do that. But we spell it out in the breakdowns. We spell it out in our, in our flyers. We spell like, this is what we're looking for. Um, and then you'd be surprised that actors come forward and say, I've never told anybody, but I am this, or I am that, or this is, because a lot of people sometimes don't want to talk about it. And this may be the first time that they're actually going to say it. This is the first time, and it's a really big moment. And I have these wonderful stories or heart to hearts of people like I never told even my parents that I had this, you know? And so you, you better believe that we do have those conversations actually, but we have to be really careful and delicate because we could get in trouble for asking as well. Um, but when you see it with, with anything, like, cause we, we're looking for somebody that has this or has that or is Native American or is whatever it is, this is your moment. That's when you like really put it in an email and you find a way to contact us and say, this is, this is me and look at my TikTok and whatever that is. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Um, over here. Yeah. Um, I'm Evangeline. I'm an autistic harpist, actor, composer, whatever. Um, so when you talk about having your TikTok, your YouTube, your content, there's, you know, so many, so much kind of content that, you know, I sometimes I put cover songs on my TikTok or I do cat and dog videos. Uh, you know, should we be doing the latest hashtag type videos? You know, there's so much about content and should we be doing it focused on this is what I would be cast at or this is what people are looking for. I'm going to try and be that because that is, or do we just create what we feel authentically, like I'm gonna put on my zombie makeup and play a song and on the harp and you know, do we need to focus on what we think you might be looking for or just be ourselves? I would think that it's good to have it in your catalog, but I look for people's personalities and their energy. And so, I mean, I was, I was, I don't remember, I was watching, oh, it's the commercial, the progressive commercial where their dad, where they're going to the jazz thing. That guy is like fantastic. And I, like, I've been trying to find out what his name is because his energy was so great. And I've done this, I do this all the time because I'm a horrible person to watch a movie or television with because all I do is I'm on my IMDB or everything else. <laughs> um, so I think that if you have like a lot of different types of film, a, little, a lot of different types of TikToks, plus you have something that shows, you know, your dramatic level. I mean, it's about the arc, you know, so. 
Right. We, we, want, we want to leave as much time as possible for one-on-one -on -one networking, so please save your questions for that. We're going to do one more, and then we'll wrap up. Hi, um, thank you so much for this panel. I was here last year, and this is one of the first times that I've actually seen a panel of casting directors that are so authentically diverse, which is so great. Um, as a queer, disabled Latinx actor, it's been so hard to penetrate the community of uh, casting directors. You know, I always heard for the last 10 years of my career, you're too much, you're a lot, and I feel like now we're just starting to scratch the surface on what authenticity means and how you can bring that to the character. I'm just wondering, how do you see that moving forward so there's more groundbreaking diverse people? Because sometimes when I see stuff in the queer community, it's a lot of white cis males or, or like they'll do that one token person of color, but they won't have the full story. So uh, that's a very specific question, but I just wanted to uh, get that from you guys, your perspective, any of you. Yes, thank you. That, that's, um, that's, that's a great question because it's a conversation that we always have with our creatives and sometimes it's not even the creatives, it's the studio or the network or whoever. And that's the fight that we have. That's the fight that I do where it's like, we're not just gonna cast one queer person and then we're done. It's like, let's have the conversation. What are you actually looking for? Are you looking for two-spirit? Are you looking for, for indigenous queer? What, like, what, what are you looking for? But I say, specifically for this, yes, we're having the conversation. We're always challenging our creatives and challenging each other to how do we further this? How do we further educating? Because I think education is, is part of that work. You as a performer who is a Latin a queer person, can educate as well. This is who I am. This is what it means to be queer Latino. This is, and, and keep doing that. But it, that could also be really exhausting. So and I always take like my mental, my mental health vacations because it's important. But but understand that there is there is a community out there for you. There is a group of us casting people that are always having this conversation and are having the fight like Victor Vasquez, Alan Luna, myself, a Steven Tyler O'Connor. Um, we're always like, how do we do this? How do we educate? But, but, but we need your help. We need you to explain to us what we don't know. So I tell you, darling, keep doing what you're doing. Keep showing your colors to people. Um, and, and it's okay to also have those hard questions for yourself, but this is when you reach out to your extended family. And this is the perfect time to reach out to your community. You know, you're not alone. We can't be attached, none of us can be attached to the outcome. You can put out the material, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get a call right away. But you keep on doing it and, and be in touch with your community so that you have a support system. Uh, as, as just a closing note, um, you can tell because I'm bringing it up again, Maureen Ryan's book, it's what I'm reading right now, and so it's heavily in my head about a, a somewhat related but very different grounded problem in Burn It Down. The, the full title is Burn It Down, Power, Complicity, and a Call for Change in Hollywood. Uh, I've, I'm past the, the horror stories of the first part, and I'm on to the second part where she's outlining how the industry can change, and this struck me. We wouldn't have TV shows, plays, films, poems, books, paintings, and all the rest if human beings weren't trying to tell one another something important or valuable about the human condition. Our panelists and all of you are doing exactly that. Keep it up. Thank you so much for coming out. All right, how about this amazing panel here? Thank you guys so much. This is truly, you know, this is a milestone. The 10th anniversary of the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge and the CSA, you guys all individually have truly been so incredible for us and the entire disability community. So one more time, round of applause for the CSA. We're gonna, we're gonna take a group photo of, of the panel right now. We got the photographers, they're gonna take a photo of us. And then those of you that know me, know that I like to have the big group photo. Well, we got too many people for everybody to come this way, so I'm gonna ask if it's okay if the panel comes down and we take one big, fun group photo, and then we got time for a little mimosas, a little bit of snacks, 
a little bit of networking, and it's all about just continuing to follow through with this amazing advice this panel gave. So one more time, thank you, Holly Shorts, the CSA, all the partners, all the casting, everyone here. Uh, what, should we should we sit or stand? I guess uh, maybe we do one. But we're we're good.